This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews with members of the U.S. intelligence community. And today I have a very interesting guest. His name is Elliot Jardin. He has a bachelor's degree from the University of New Mexico, a master's degree from University of Connecticut. He spent 11 years in U.S. Army intelligence, both active duty and reserves. He is the founder of the OSINT uh, Foundation, and he is the uh, president of Gnosis Solutions. But most important for today's uh, conversation, he was the first assistant deputy uh, director of national intelligence for open source. Elliot, welcome to AFIO Now. Thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be with you and to uh, be part of uh, the show. Thanks. Elliot, how did you get started in open source? Was it while you were in uh, Army Intelligence? So, yes, the um, back in the early 1990s, uh, the Army was wrestling with this new concept of uh, open source intelligence. And uh, at the time, I was assigned to a strategic intelligence detachment. A reserve unit that actually uh, was affiliated with Yale University. And we had been doing for much of our uh, unit's existence back to uh, the end of World War II, had been doing open source studies. Uh, and so the Army felt that given our area of expertise, it would be great if the unit could develop a handbook for the basic military intelligence officers course. And so we went about putting together an, an OSINT handbook. And, uh, and that's how I got uh, started with uh, OSINT, ultimately. Tell our viewers uh, how OSINT differs from other forms of intelligence. The main difference, I would say, between OSINT and the other disciplines is that if you think about the traditional intelligence disciplines, what I like to call the better funded intelligence disciplines, we own the means of collection. Right. That's a pretty straightforward concept, right? We are doing the intercepts. We have recruited the human sources. We are taking the imagery photographs. With open sources, we don't own the means of collection. So we are, by definition, secondhand users of that information. So someone else has done the collecting, the editing, and the publishing of that information, and we're leveraging that. So in many ways, you can think of open source as a passive discipline, right? We are not actively collecting. We're not actively poking the target. We are simply acquiring the information secondhand. OSINT practitioners like to make that distinction between acquisition and collection. And people may think that that's just semantics, but in reality, it's a great way to highlight Hey, remember, we didn't collect this. And so if you're a human, -ter, you never have to doubt whether the source said what was reported. Whether the source is lying or not, right, that's a different issue. But the report, you never have to doubt the, the signals intercept. You never have to doubt that the photograph was actually taken because we own the means of collection. With open source, that requires an additional level of vetting and knowledge with the source that we're targeting to ensure that, right? Because a photograph can be, can be manipulated, certainly press reporting. We see that very frequently in social media with online bots. Um, and it's very prevalent right now with the Russian uh, invasion of uh, Ukraine. The Russians are employing lots of chat bots and, and the like uh, on social media. And so it looks like there's much more reporting than, than ultimately there really is. Elliot, help us understand the difference between OSINT and publicly available information, PAI. Yeah, so that's a great question. And right now there's, there's a great deal of confusion with regards to that. Um, and so from a definition standpoint, right? So open source intelligence is legally defined in public law 109-153, right? And it has three components. The first component is it's publicly available information. So traditionally, publicly available information is defined as information that a member of the general public could be reasonably expected to get access to through request, observation, or purchase. So that's the first component. So 
publicly available information is utilized, and then we collect that information, exploit it, and disseminate it. So there's a processing of that information. And then the third, which is a critical component of the definition of OSINT, is that it's for the purpose of addressing a specific intelligence requirement. One could say that many people do, people exploit publicly available information. So law enforcement does, uh, the civil affairs, the public affairs community certainly does. Commercially, all sorts of publicly available information research is done for what I would broadly consider due diligence investigations, companies, individuals, protective intelligence type work. But open source intelligence and PAI are frequently used interchangeably, but really they're not because it ultimately, if it's not being done to satisfy a particular intelligence requirement, then it's public, it's PAI research, not OSINT. And that notion also of publicly available confuses a lot of folks. And I see a lot of vendors who talk about, we have unique sources of information available nowhere else in our publicly available information repository. Well, if it's not available anywhere else, by definition, it's not publicly available. Uh, and so some of uh, the technologies uh, and sources of information that most raise concerns about civil liberties are misattributed to OSINT when they are not publicly available information. And so that, that's a key distinction that, um, that is, is being uh, discussed very frequently right now. And in part, it's because many other elements, such as the special operations community, law enforcement, civil affairs, engage in publicly available information research, and that tends to muddy the water a bit. But the intelligence community has very clearly defined requirements for how we do it to ensure that we, we abide by Executive Order 12333 and the existing policy framework that protects civil rights and civil liberties. So it's a great question. And uh, Got it, uh, help me get my head around this. Um, could you give us a couple of examples, maybe historic examples of the uh, collection and use of OSINT? Sure. Uh, so an example of publicly available information that was done many years ago, but I think is a great example, was as uh, Hitler came to power, he began rearming the German military which was a direct violation of the World War I peace accords. And there was a German Jew named Bertolt Jakob, who was a writer. He clearly saw what Hitler was doing, the anti-Semitism and Hitler's larger ambitions. And he decided to write a book. In that book, he chronicled how Hitler was rearming. Very interestingly enough, the 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 back of the book has a detailed order of battle listing of all of the new units that weren't supposed to exist. Um, and so the book was published in 1936. I, I've got a copy of it here. Uh, it's called The New German Military and Their Fuhrer. When the book was published, by this point, Bertolt Jakob had fled to France, published the book there, and it infuriated Hitler. Hitler was convinced he had a high-level spy feeding Jakob this information. He he ordered the book banned and it was burned on site. Um, and uh, it took me about a decade and much in the way of resources to find a copy because it was uh, on the top 10 list of books to be burned if found. And so Hitler ordered the Gestapo to kidnap Mr. Jakob. They posed as literary agents, convinced him to, to come to Austria, ultimately kidnapped, drugged him and kidnapped and brought him across the border into Germany and interrogated him for a number of weeks. This is before Hitler began invading countries or the reunification with Austria. There was still sensitivity to public opinion. Uh, with the Nazi regime, and he was a well-known journalist. And so ultimately he was released, but uh, he was released because in spite of being tortured, uh, he kept insisting that he had gotten everything from publicly available information. And so they finally, in frustration, asked him to prove it. He requested the regional newspapers 
from Germany, which he could easily get in France. And he, t- much to their chagrin, showed them that he could get a low-level look, a bottom-up look at the German military by looking at graduation notices for basic training and basic officer courses, a mid-level look at the new German military by looking at wedding and christenings notices, um, which all contained rank and unit of affiliation for the officers, and then a top-down look at the new German military by looking at death notices and retirement notices. So ultimately, he was released. Germans claimed it was uh, a big misunderstanding. But but that's a great example of how you can use publicly available information simply by aggregating the data over time. A more modern example of open source intelligence, I think, was highlighted during um, the congressional after action report of the original uh, U.S. invasion of Iraq. And Before that invasion, General Schwarzkopf had his vaunted left hook maneuver where we were going to amass in front of the Iraqis, lean forward, grit our teeth and look mean. And then when the lights went out at night, we were going to sneak around to the side and surprise them. Well, that move required an unprecedented amount of troops and, and heavy equipment through vast stretches of uninhabited desert. And so the request from uh, the J-2, the intelligence folks at, at the Central Command, went out to DIA, hey, we need soil composition and trafficability analysis for these vast stretches of uninhabited desert. And uh, as you can imagine, that's not exactly high on the intelligence uh, priorities list, certainly wasn't at the time. So DIA turned the building upside down. We had simply zero holdings in the classified databases for that type of data. And in a last ditch effort before we dropped special forces behind enemy lines to do soil composition and trafficability analysis, very dangerous, very costly, and also a real threat to OPSEC because if the Iraqis simply followed the special forces troops, they would know the route we would likely take. So before that, they reached out, DIA reached out to the Federal Research Division of the Library of Congress, and they found in the stacks the information we were looking for. And it turns out almost 100 years earlier, a group of American archaeologists had received grant funding because they had done textual analysis and had decided that they had a good understanding of where the likely final resting place of Noah's Ark would be. And so they traveled the area on camelback and wisely chose to get off their camels and do soil composition and trafficability analysis, reasoning that it would be better to have a good understanding of how they were going to get this massive artifact out before they got. And as you can imagine, they didn't find anything, but because they had received a grant, they dutifully filed their report with the Library of Congress. And that document sat on the shelf for about 100 years and was never checked out. And that just shows you the value of data. People will frequently ask me, well, how long should I keep the data? And the answer is forever, because the value of data changes over time. That study was worthless for 90 years. uh, And then all of a sudden, it became very important. And so I like that example because it demonstrates that the value of data changes over time. We don't throw anything away. Hard disk space is cheap. And number two, it also shows you that the information, someone has typically collected that information. And our job as OSINT professionals is to figure out who might have collected this information and where might they have published it. So it's great uh, what Congress called out-of-the-box thinking with regards to open source. Um, so those are two good examples, kind of differentiate PAI from OSINT. Elliot, that's a, a great story, and those are two very good examples. Tell our audience where you think OSINT is headed in the future. So that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think in order to understand where we're headed, we've got to talk about where we've been. And so I, I really see that there are three distinct eras for for open source, right? The, the first one being what I would call, for lack of a better term, the analog era, which began, we've been doing open source for a long time. Commanders during the Civil War lamented the media publishing details. And in the Revolutionary War, the Brits complained about colonial news sources, you know, publishing things that that they felt 
helped uh, the rebels. But, you know, in terms of an official start uh, for OSINT, that began February of 1941 with the FCC under the Federal Communications Commission with what was then called the Federal Broadcast Monitoring Service. Roughly a year later, it was called, renamed the Foreign Broadcast Information Service, FBIS or FIBIS, what um, what we for many, many years loved uh, and revered. And uh, I used to look forward to getting my hard copy FIBIS publications. And we knew which one was ours, right? Our part of the world by the color uh, on the cover. Um, and so, you know, that was uh, ultimately incorporated into the CIA. And right up until I would say the establishment of the World Wide Web. That was the analog period where we were looking at print, reporting, broadcast, TV and radio, um, some great literature, but very little in terms of the digital arena. And with the advent of the World Wide Web, um, we move into you know what I would call the digital era, where uh, you know now we're looking at the internet, uh, exploiting websites, um, increasingly looking at uh, social media exploitation, some folks called SOCMINT, uh, social media intelligence. And that coincided, the advent of the World Wide Web is really when the bar for entry to do OSINT was lowered significantly. Before that, we're going to do broadcast monitoring. You've got to have the equipment and listening posts and whatnot. Um, with the World Wide Web, this, at that point, many other folks who didn't have uh, FBIS's infrastructure worldwide could begin to exploit um, publicly available information. And so the advent of the World Wide Web is really when you start to see the military really begin to uh, jump on board with OSINT and uh, incorporating OSINT into day-to-day -day intelligence uh, operations. So we are, I would say, now entering a new era. To, uh, again, for lack of a established term, uh, let's call the augmented reality era. And so the technology for virtual reality uh, has uh, progressed quite a bit. Facebook has the metaverse. Apple is uh, establishing a competing virtual reality. And we see the military and many other commercial activities engaging or using augmented reality glasses or goggles where you're looking through those goggles at the real world, but you're getting additional readouts and additional information. So if you think back to the Terminator movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger, he'd look at something and had this constantly scrolling news or information feed. If he looked at a motorcycle, it would give him all the details of the motorcycle. When he got into the 18-wheeler, it would give him the schematics of how to shift the thing. And so we're moving to the point where that's going to be very common. Right? So you can buy a virtual reality headset for a couple hundred dollars and play all sorts of games and simulations. We are now having to graph, grapple with that. Right. So how do we do OSINT exploitation in the virtual reality arena? And so data science has become critical for sifting through that tsunami of data. And likewise, uh, GIS, geospatial information systems, that integration with things like ad tech, uh, advertising technology that's geolocated is, is critical because nowadays, Everyone is issued a permanent surveillance capability, right? It looks like this, uh, and we issued it to ourselves. We did this to ourselves. But with ad tech data, I can't purchase the subscriber information for a user, but I can purchase the geolocational data for the unique subscriber ID number. So it won't say this is Elliot Jardine's cell phone, but if you buy access to the ad tech repository, that locational data is available. And if I draw a box around my house, that's called geofencing, it will show all of the unique subscriber IDs that are listed that are at that house. And it would take you very little time to figure out which one of those cell phones was mine versus my kids or my wife. And so ultimately, right, that's minute by minute geolocational data, which help establish patterns, patterns of life, you know, where you're going, what you 
what you're doing. And that can be very helpful from an intelligence perspective and counterintelligence perspective and something that a great deal um, is being done in terms of OSINT to support the other disciplines. Because if you're a human inter, we want to ensure that we have trade craft to ensure that the adversary isn't tracking your every move. Th- those are the three areas. So I, uh, eras, um, and I would say, you know, we're headed into that virtual reality space. Uh, a great example of how we're going to mesh those two was a movie released a few years ago called Ready Player One, which follows a kid playing video games in this augmented reality. And he's using it both in his day-to-day and in his video gaming. And so uh, we're just at the tip of that explosion. And um, very soon, uh, I think it's going to dramatically change our day-to-day activities, both in the intelligence community and just our day-to-day lives. Elliot, why is there the need for a OSINT association, a professional association? And how does the foundation plan to address that? Yeah. So for a number of years, I've been discussing with other seniors in the community the need for greater professionalization of those OSINT disciplines. And so if we look across the intelligence community, we have the haves and the have-nots. And the larger organizations uh, like the CIA has the open source enterprise, right? So FBIS in 2005 was renamed and refocused a bit. Uh, It was the DNI Open Source Center. And then when the CIA reorganized and established the Directorate of Digital Innovation, they pulled uh, the Open Source Center into that new directorate and renamed it the Open Source Enterprise. That has the, the agency is a very robust career field, standards, infrastructure. So the OSO or Open Source Officer career field is well-defined and whatnot. And then from that point, we sort of drop off a cliff in terms of structure and resources And everybody else is a much smaller effort. Um, And so it can be, you know, DIA has the open source, uh, the OSIC, and that's focused. But again, it's much smaller than the CIA's open source enterprise. Uh, And then the services all have capability, DHS, FBI, Treasury, State Department. State Department recently established a new strategic open source center. Um, But outside of the agency, that career field, career progression, professional development doesn't really exist. And then standards also are a bit in flux, right? And so if you look at the traditional intelligence disciplines, if someone was speaking about signals intelligence and kept referring to that as SIGINT or was speaking about human intelligence and kept referring to HUMINT, we wouldn't give them much credibility. And in our discipline, it's pronounced OSINT with an S. It's not OSINT with a Z and it's not OSINT, but you frequently hear those terms. And that ultimately speaks to the lack of maturity of the discipline because nobody says humant. That's a well-established, everybody says human. So I kid with people and I say, Ozint is what the munchkins <laughs> conducted on the yellow brick road trying to count how many flying monkeys the Wicked Witch of the West had, right? That's Ozint. Osint with a soft S is the intelligence discipline. And so you know, that, that's just an example, right? There's a lot of questions about definitions and lots of entities are looking to establish their own definitions and nobody in human or SIGINT circles say, well, you know, let's define, let's redefine human and SIGINT. Why? Because it's codified in law and OSINT is codified in law, that definition. And so the fact that many people don't know that the definition that we have a legal definition Um, again, speaks to a a lack of formalization of the discipline outside of the CIA and DIA. And so we think a foundation is needed because we want to help establish those fundamentals, have folks all on the same sheet of music in terms of what do we mean when we say OSINT? What do we mean when we say PAI? What are the tradecraft standards? Um, and then what are the typical policies that govern? What authorities do we have? And while each agency has their own unique authorities and mission, we want to, with a 
the development of an open source intelligence foundation, the OSINT Foundation, try to partner with the IC to help establish those standards, then give folks a professional, an opportunity for professional development, and also then the opportunity to engage with colleagues. So there aren't conferences for open source, that kind of thing. And so that's kind of the goal, right, is to, to move in that arena, eventually move towards having a professional certification standards, look to push that down to the undergraduate arena, graduate students, so that they graduate from intelligence studies programs with a fundamental understanding of what the IC means when it says OSINT and what OSINT tradecraft look like, looks like and what are the sub-disciplines of open source. It's not just social media. There's print, broadcast, gray literature, ephemera, you know, commercial imagery, so on and so forth. And so that fundamental understanding. And then we want to want to do recognition. Nothing highlights for leadership the importance of the work that their OSINT elements are doing uh, than an outside entity, a nonprofit like the OSINT Foundation, recognizing an individual, a unit, um, and then an IC senior leader champion for OSINT. So those are all critical functions. And that's why we feel like we need an OSINT foundation, um, a professional association. So what the Bar Association, what the American Bar Association is to lawyers, what the American Medical Association is to doctors, is what we'd like to see the OSINT foundation be for OSINT practitioners. Elliot, as we discussed off camera, Athio has a large and growing uh, academic audience. Do you have any advice for young people uh, in college or about to enter college who are not only interested in entry into the U.S. intelligence community, but specifically interested in the discipline of OSINT? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So first and foremost, if you're interested in uh, OSINT, then you have to have a clear understanding of the dangers of what you personally post. That's a a critical thing that uh, individuals have an understanding that if it's posted, it's going to be there forever. Um, It can be found, right? There are many very embarrassing statements that individuals make. And then 10, 15 years later, at a congressional hearing for their confirmation for a post, they've got to answer questions about why did you make this comment back when you were 18, 19, 20 years of age? So that's an important component. Number two, obviously, you've got to pass a security clearance. And so abiding by those drug use may be common, um, but not uh, not something that's going to facilitate a security clearance. But then things like Specifically for open source, language and cultural exposure are are critical. The vast majority of publicly available information sources are not in English. And while folks may say, well, I can do machine translation, the reality is machine translation is not going to give you the cultural insights and won't be able to deal with idioms uh, effectively. And, you know, we, we talked about that. And so that's really critical. If you're going to do OSINT exploitation against Russia, then you should have some understanding of the language and the culture. So the more that you can engage in area studies, language studies as an undergraduate, um, that's important. I mentioned that as we move into the augmented reality era, data data science is going to be critically important. So courses around data science um, are not only very good for OSINT, but are highly rewarded by the marketplace right now. If you're a data scientist with uh, TSSCI clearances, you can expect a eye-popping salary. So that's point number one. If you have those clearances, uh, I would love to talk to you if you're a data scientist, because we have a constant need for that. So anything you can learn in terms of data science uh, and the scripting languages around data science, um, which are pretty approachable, it's not hardcore. It's not hardcore computer programming. Those are phenomenal skill sets that will be ever more uh, important. And then experience with writing for publication. Ultimately, the key to the effectiveness of any intelligence professional is going to be their writing. Because if you can't convey it to a policymaker or senior intelligence official, 
you can't convey it effectively, then it might as well never have happened in the first place. So th- those would be my recommendations. Well, that's great advice. And I'm sure the uh, professors and students will find that very useful. I want to thank uh, Elliot uh, Jardin and the OSINT Foundation for both a very interesting and uh, informative session. All right. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it.